As I write about Satan, the more I write about him, the more it struck me that Satan is kind of like an evil Gumby. Remember that little green dude about yay tall, claymation figure? You could bend him and make him whatever you wanted to. Yeah, that's what I think of when I think of Satan now. Because Satan is this character, this figure that you can bend and flex and do whatever you want with. Satan shows up in music, in literature, art, cartoons, movies, and comics. He shows up all over the place. And he is everything from the source of infinite evil to this little thing on your shoulder saying, hey, grab another cookie, and, and everything in between. And Satan is this like infinitely malleable thing. And it's not a surprise that you can play around with Satan because it feels less risky than playing around with God. You don't want to really hack off God by trying to bend God to fit your image, but Satan, why not? And so, part of what makes this possible, the, the fact that Satan can become so malleable, is that you can't say, the Bible says Satan is... It, it actually isn't consistent across the Bible what, what Satan is. And, and so what we're going to do today and over the next couple weeks is uh, we're going to look at this. Because I think it's important to understand Satan. Uh, only in as much as to avoid him. But also to understand that there's just different places in the Bible that say different things about Satan. So today we're going to look at the Old Testament and Paul's letter. Next week we'll get to the Gospels. Then the third week, that, that'll be the fun week with Revelation and dragons and all that fun fun stuff. But today we're going we're gonna to look at this and, and, and we're going to start with, with the Old Testament. And I think it's important to notice two things about uh, the Old Testament. First, the Old Testament begins maybe like 1500 B.C., and the New Testament is written like up to 100 A.D. It's not a surprise that when you go to the very beginning of the Old Testament, and you go all the way to the New Testament, that is a span of time that is just immense. The length that our country has existed is just a drop in the bucket compared to the spans of time that we're talking about biblically here. And so it's not going to be a big surprise that the understanding of Satan changes. The other thing I think it's important to note on the front end about the Old Testament especially is that when you read the Old Testament, their assumption is that there is a spiritual world, a world of the unseen that is just as active as everything you can see. I mean, if you just think of how the conception of what a person is, a person is uh, dust material stuff that God has breathed into. Material and immaterial stuff and spiritual. So that's, everything has a material and a spiritual side as we read about this in the Old Testament. And we start with one of the oldest stories of the Bible. As long as there have been Jews around a campfire, they've been telling this story, the story of Job. And we begin the story of Job. We read the, the beginning of it this day. And when we read of how God calls together all the sons of God, all the angels, angel means messenger, so all of God's messengers, all of God's agents upon the earth, and God calls them all together in this grand court, and he asks, ah, everyone's coming up and sort of giving their report. And he gets to this one angel, and this angel is the Satan. If you get out your study Bible and you read in your notes, it says the Satan. It's one of the places where those three letters are just so essential, so essential because whenever you read the word Satan in the Old Testament, it is not a name. It is a description. It's a job title. It's like the janitor, the lawyer, the Satan. And, and the Satan is a job and the job of the Satan is to accuse or to block, or to get in the way. The Satan is God's angel who gets in the way of people and accuses them. That's the job title of the Satan. And it's much like we have a prosecuting attorney for our courthouse, right? you got to have someone to say, uh, and, and that's what the Satan is. It's the angel who goes, uh. And, and it's kind of funny to imagine this, because it never says that the Satan has to be the same angel. I, I have no proof to go on by this, but it is interesting to imagine. Is it something that got passed around? Did they draw lots? Were there points when someone got, drew, drew the lot to be the Satan this year, and they went, oh man, I don't want to be the Satan. That's a bummer. Okay, because you do what God tells you. Well, I don't know if that's the case, but that makes it clear. This is a job that is done. 
And, and so, the Satan shows up to do his job, and he accuses, that's his job, right? He accuses Job that Job only loves God because, well, you always look out for him, God. And he wouldn't love you if you didn't look out for him. And that's a pretty fair accusation, right? When everything's going great, of course you love God. Everything's wonderful. But if you messed with him, uh, he wouldn't love you anymore. And so that's the basis for the book of Job, is this, does Job love God because God makes everything right, or because he loves God? And that's, this unfolds, and at the end of the book of Job, it turns out that Job does love God, and through the process of going through these sufferings, he loves God in a way that is more thoughtful, and more wise, and more experienced. So that while he begins the book of Job as this worrying, obsessive parent who makes offerings just in case his, parent, his kids might have done something wrong, by the end of the book of Job, he is giving his daughters an inheritance, which is just simply not done in that time, and he is naming his daughters things like cinnamon, dove, dark eyes, named after the coal that they used to, for the makeup. Um, and so he goes from being this stick in the mud to someone who is giving his daughters these sort of sensual, fun names, and he's joyous, and he's generous, and he is, through this process, you never choose to want to go through what Job went through, but by the end of it, he loves God in a way that more fully reflects God. This is a good thing. The Satan did his job, he, the job that God had appointed for him, and now Job loves God more fully, and, and, and he has been, Job has been refined and purified in the process. Another place where the Satan shows up is uh, it's kind of hidden. Anytime you see, not only whenever you see Satan, you need to put the in front of it. Whenever you're reading the Old Testament, it's always the Satan. There's also, if you read about the accuser, that's the same thing. That is the Satan, the accuser. And it shows up in this story of Balaam. So the story of Balaam, right? Balaam has, is a sorcerer of some sort soothsayer or whatever. And he has been hired and offered an ungodly large amount of money to curse Israel, the Israelite people. Like, this is an amount of money you retire on and your grandkids don't have to work type of money. And so he really wants to be able to curse Israel because he wants the money. And so he gets on his donkey and he's riding down to curse Israel and God does not want him to curse Israel. And so God sends the accuser, the Satan, in front of him to say... That's a bad idea. You might want to reconsider. You can't go down this path. And, and that's, that's what happens, right? That's exactly what, what happens. At some point, the donkey talks back, and, and, and then he sees the angel with a sword playing the role of the Satan. And, the Satan, and he tells him this path is blocked, and uh, he doesn't go down that path. He does not curse the Jewish people. And so that's, again, that's what the Satan does. The Satan not only accuses, but it also blocks the path when you're walking down and going somewhere you should not go. Now, allowing the Satan uh, to be used for good, this does show up in the New Testament as well. Paul, who's Jewish, he takes this understanding of the Satan, and when he is giving advice to the church at Corinth, this is how he advises people when there is a problem in the church. And the problem is this. There is a son who's sleeping with his mom. Could be a stepmom. Either way, this is bad. This is very bad. And he, Paul, his, his advice to them, 1 Corinthians 5, is kick the bum out, give him to the Satan. Not because that's it, he's gone, he's lost, he has lost all potential, he is now doomed and damned forever. He says, give him over to the Satan for the salvation of his soul. Give him over to the Satan and let the Satan accuse and block and mess with him until he realizes that path he's walking down. Uh-uh. That's not supposed to do that. It, it, that's what happens, right? And it's not that Paul sees the Satan as evil. Paul sees the Satan as God's tool for hard cases. And this is also how Paul understands the thorn in his side in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about how he has a thorn in his side. Anyone here have a thorn in their side, something that slows them down? Paul had a thorn in his side, something that just bothered him to no end. And he prayed three times, God, remove this from me. And God said, you know, this is for you to understand that you need to depend upon me. You can't do it all under your own power. And you know what Paul called the thorn in his side? A messenger of the Satan. I had a thorn in my side, a messenger of the Satan. This is God sending God's angel, the Satan, to do the task of poking me, accusing me, reminding me. Stop trying to do it all yourself, Paul. Paul got the message. 
It took a while, but you know, sometimes that's what it takes. And so these are the images of the Satan in the Old Testament. One who accuses, one who blocks, one who, who works in the hard situations to get your attention. What's the one passage we did not talk about in the Old Testament that y'all expected? What, what, do y'all, what do y'all expect to talk about when you talk about Satan in the Old Testament? Snake, right? I think I heard so. You expect to hear about the snake, right? Genesis 3, the snake. If you read that, you'll notice something. The snake in Genesis 3 is a snake. That's all it is. There's no trickery there. There's no imagery. There's no like hidden Hebrew like mind tricks or anything. No, it's just a snake. Now down the road, two Sundays from now, snakes and serpents and revelation will come up. But if you're reading the Old Testament and you read about the snake making an offer in the Garden of Eden, it's just a snake. This week we end this section of the Bible with this understanding of Satan as presented by the Old Testament as then further presented by Paul. And uh, if you pay attention to what the Satan does, it's the one who helps you when you're in a hard spot, in a sense. It, when, uh, what that hymn we just sang, we'll understand it better by and by. You go through hard times in your life, you don't understand it, and then you'll understand it better by and by. Down the road you look back and you see, for example, I had to go up for ordination three times. Can you imagine graduating with your high school class except you graduate with the, with the sophomores because you got delayed multiple times? That's what it's like to be ordained on the third attempt. I was being ordained with people who had watched me come in, and I was still there. It was humiliating. It was utterly humiliating. And I would never choose to do it again, but I did feel just a bit like Job. And on the end of it, I had learned something. My calling, my job, my future is not dependent upon the approval of of a system. My future, my calling is dependent upon what happens right here. And I need that, and that's useful, and it's good for insurance purposes, but right here is what matters. And I could have told you that before I got turned down multiple times, but now I know it. Right? That's the Satan in my life. Wouldn't want to wish it on anyone, but it happens. There was a time in my life, going back a couple years further, I was going to be a microbiologist. I was hiding towards a master's up at Michigan State, and I was going to go probably to the West Coast and work at a lab. And that was my plan. Like, I had filled out the applications. I was getting ready to go off and study this. And the donkey did not talk to me, but I did not go down that path. It's kind of hard to turn. Once you're down the path, you get, this is where I'm going, right? Except then it's not where you're going. At the time, did not appreciate it, but now I can see the Satan. Thank God for the Satan. Words you didn't expect to hear me say this morning. (laughs) And so in your own lives, you can look back upon these these struggles, the times you were humiliated, the times you have gone down one path and then turned to another. And now that it is in the by and by, now that that has gone past, can you look back and see that that might have been the Satan? That might have been God's will for you. That might have been the hard thing you needed to hear or know or understand. I I hope that's what you can take from this day. When hard times come, it does not mean God has deserted you. It may mean that God is most fully with you. And it just might be the Satan. Thanks be to God. Amen. We confess.